Um, well, hi, everyone. Welcome again to the News Philanthropy Network series on corporate giving. This is our second of third sessions, and I'm so, so thrilled to introduce our presenter our today, presenter. who is amazing, Johanna Derlega, who is the CRO, Chief Revenue Officer of the 19th, an incredible news organization um, covering uh, politics and, and gender identity. Um, before joining the 19th, Johanna was publisher of The Hill newspaper in Washington, DC, and I will turn it over to her. Hi, all. It's so nice to meet you. I'm so thrilled to be with you. Um, so I have a very quick uh, slide deck. Um, I'm not like the, the best on slide deck. So I'm gonna run through this really quickly. But what I would love to do is make this as much Q&A as possible. Um, and I obviously, I'm new to nonprofit journalism too. This is, I'm just entering year four. So some of you have expertise that I don't. And so there will be times I'm gonna throw it out to you um, as uh, as people have questions. So <laughs> I'm gonna move my chat to my other screen so I can see it as I go. Um, and I'll just be a couple of minutes on uh, the slide deck. And let's see, Yasi, I'm not seeing the place to move it like I did before. Oh, let's see. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. I forgot to hit the button. <laughs> it's totally fine. It's like, oh no, I, I, it could have been user error. Um, so I'm Johanna Derlega, um, the Chief Revenue Officer of the 19th. Um, I'm going to just do a little bit of background here on um, who we are. We are a news organization covering the nexus of politics, policy, and gender. And um, really, when we started about three and a half years ago, uh, we looked out into the market and realized that representation, really representative newsrooms, didn't exist. Um, and so we really were created to solve that problem. Um, and uh, what we were hoping and what we continue to, to see more and more is that when people see themselves reflected in the journalism, they're more likely to be engaged in democracy. And that's really our mission statement. And that's what we've done. We've built a diverse newsroom. Um, you can see here, uh, we're across 18 states so far. Um, you know, we are based in Austin, but um, our newsroom reports from their communities. Um, we're 65% non-white, 19% um, <clears throat> are living with disabilities. 30% are LGBTQ. And um, we really feel that, um, you know, this is us living our mission is creating this representative newsroom. So one of the other differentiators for us is that most politics and policy news organizations are based in Washington, about Washington, for Washington. And we certainly cover policymakers, but we're also covering the people that policy impacts. And that really sets us apart. And so our audience tends to be policymakers, <clears throat> both here in Washington, I'm based in Washington, as well as across the country. Um, and then also grassroots en engaged. So people who care about what's happening in their communities, what's happening in their schools, in their workplaces, um, the issues they care most about are gender equity, racial equity, well, I'm just, I'm in a webinar. climate change. Oh. I'm sorry, Trish, did you have a question? Oh. And here's just a little snapshot of our audience. And this is an audience, um, I'll get into a little bit how we've grown. Um, you know, we are, we see audience growth as a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and we have really found that um, so far we've had a lot of civically engaged folks on our core, um, on our site, in our newsletter, and in our events. Um, but obviously we're a nonprofit newsroom. And so we have a distributed model, which means that um, anyone can republish uh, the news that we offer. Um, they can read it, they can republish it. And so we also have uh, the chance to meet our audience where they are off platform. And um, while that does not um, help us in terms of our revenue, our corporate revenue and our sponsor revenue, it certainly helps us as we do the fundraising. So these are our values and this is what we started with. You know, we, everything is audience centric, everything we do. 
Um, that means that we are not creating commodity content just to drive scale for the sake of scale and eyeballs to drive revenue. Um, and we also don't do any programmatic ads. We are selling everything direct. Um, and we feel really strongly about that because obviously, um, you know, we stand for, um, as a nonprofit, we, we stand for our mission and we hope that the advertising is as enticing and interesting to our audience as is our journalism. So based on that, we created, these are kind of what we started out with. These are our sponsorships. We have a website, we have a newsletter. We sell the website and the newsletter weekly. Um, and that really offsets, you know, we're not doing any CPM, which means that we're not putting undue pressure on our newsroom to deliver CPMs, right? We, that, then we don't have to do this commodity content. I give ranges of what I think um, people will get in a week of advertising. Honestly, if, if they don't reach it, then I offer them another week. You know, I, we, I'm very clear that I work for a nonprofit newsroom and that we're just launching. Um, and they've been quite wonderful in terms of if, if the off chance that we're really off base in terms of some estimates that I'm giving them, um, I just give them another week. And then we also have events opportunities um, where people can basically the integration is logo presence. They can also do opening remarks um, for some of our larger multi-day events. We offer 10 minute sponsor kind of presentations. They're clearly marked sponsor. Um, and so one of the things that um, we were really trying to figure out, I'm going to go back to the site advertising, is how do we site serve? So you know, for me, I, it was just me. I was the only person doing corporate revenue, which meant that I was going out and selling it. Um, I was managing the revenue department, um, which included a major donor person as well as a foundation person. Um, and I was selling the ads and then I was putting them up and then I was reporting. And so one of the things, one of the decisions I made was to make an investment in um, an, a site serving or an ad serving um, platform called Broad Street. And they're really great for local news organizations um, or smaller news organizations. I just needed help. I didn't even know how to, I'd always worked in, in newsrooms and where I had an ad ops person and I didn't, and I had to learn it. And Broad Street was really great um, in terms of having someone always available. If someone sent um, ad code instead of camera ready art, they could help me put that up. Um, they helped me understand how to serve ads. And we don't personally use this, but they actually also offer a lot of different types of ad units um, that is, is really amazing for local publishers. For instance, there's like a restaurant ad and um, a retail ad. So it looks like, um, was it Teresa? Yes. Yeah, so Teresa uses them. They, they've been really wonderful um, because it was just me and I'm, and I'm still, I just hired a consultant um, an ad op consultant, but it was just basically me for years doing this. So I needed to create really simple opportunities, not only for the newsroom, but for, you know, ultimately not spending more time on ad ops than selling. So this is what we offer <clears throat> in terms of digital. Uh, we offer two options. One is a digital takeover and it includes um, site advertising, 50% share of voice across our entire website. Um, and then a one day homepage takeover, which I'll show you in a second, just kind of larger scale ads, and then a week of the newsletter. And that includes kind of a, a slug at the top. It includes a, th a 300 by 250 and then kind of a 200 character uh, message from, from the sponsor. Or if they just want site advertising, you know, $7,500 a week for the other 50% share of voice, as well as a homepage takeover. And this is what it looks like. So basically, um, you know, here is the standard ads. The th uh, we have a 970 by 250 on um, mobile. It's a 300 by 250. And then um, we also do the takeover units are our larger scale. Sorry, I'm just going to go. Oh, ad ops. Okay. So I'm just looking at the um, I'm just looking at the chat here. So ad ops is ad operations. So once you've sold ads, um, you have to actually put them up on your site and you need an ad server that is, it's a third party platform 
Um, and it basically serves the ads for you. So it measures the ads, it puts them up on your site. You have to obviously create on your website containers for those ads, but all the back end is done on an ad platform. And ad ops is the ad operations. So it's putting the ads up, um, it's monitoring them for traffic, um, it's letting an advertiser know if you don't think that, you know, if you're way off in terms of traffic and need to extend it another week. And then it's reporting afterwards, which includes the number of impressions, um, an ad has received, the click-throughs, and that's ad operations. Let me make sure I haven't missed anything else. So Maya, that is a very good question. Um, you know, we are given um, what we do and our mission. We, I am pretty picky about who I reach out to. We have, and so, and I keep updated on the news. So if there's an organization that has a major class action lawsuit, like a gender discrimination lawsuit, you know, I tend to, um, not reach out to them. Um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, we have the luxury with corporate to do that, to actually things are in the news, major donors, foundations, you know, they're, it's harder to, to uh, honestly make sure that that is all on the up and up. And so in some ways, you know, obviously for, there's a huge risk for us reputationally, if we bring in a lot of advertisers that are trying to wash their image. Um, but at the same time, we are, uh, uh, we want to create sustainable journalism. And so honestly, it's, it's um, something that we've been working on internally is setting up a really clear set of standards. Um, it's probably something we should have done <laughs> earlier. Um, but I, I don't think that we realized things have really changed. And it used to be that as long as everything was really transparent it was clear that that was separate from the news organization, but now I think that people are really quite concerned and, and trust is important with our, our readers. And I think we really do have to cross that bridge of setting a set of guidelines. So that's something we're working on currently. Um, and um, I'll keep you posted about that. So here's our newsletter sponsorships. Um, there's the sponsored by banner at the top, the 300 by 250, um, and also kind of a block with um, some uh, information. Honestly, there are times that people just want the newsletter. I had one group um, come in. They wanted a they wanted once a month for the entire year of just newsletter, and I sold it to them. Um, so there are times I do that, and I sell that for fifteen thousand. But I do I prefer to package it. Um, I think packaging is really important as you're thinking about all of your offerings because you can ultimately up the price. And then here are our events. So um, again, our events range from um, our larger events that are multi-sponsor. We have opportunities from 30,000 to 150,000. Um, and at the $150,000 level, those founding sponsors have their logo on everything that we send out pre-event across social, um, in our newsletter, on our website, we run um, co-branded ads with them. And then um, at the event itself, they have kind of logo presence on the backdrop the entire time. Um, and virtually it's, you know, in that kind of frame. Um, and then they also have up to a 10 minute sponsor presentation. Um, and then the kind of, the, that's a multi-day event. So it's a much larger opportunity you, know, you have to think about the ratios of content versus sponsor. Um, and given three days of, of coverage, we felt 10 minutes was 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 okay. Um, at our smaller events, you know, our one-on-ones, um, similar to, for instance, the 19th Celebrates series, that's just really a, a interview. One interview, it's about 40 minutes. And so what we offer sponsors is a two-minute welcome remarks. Um, and we charge 50000 for that. I package in a week of advertising for every single um, larger scale sponsor. So for our founding sponsors, not at that $30,000 level, that's really just logo presence. Um, but uh, again, I think packaging it up means that I can, I can sell it for a premium. So who are my potential buyers? You know, for us, again, we are really um, covering DEI. We are looking at... Um, you know, the issues of equity. So we are really a thought leader 
by. This is for organizations that hopefully right, are doing this work. Um, they want to be showcased as doing this work. And I just included a couple of examples here. We've got the Principal Foundation, Visa, Pharma did um, a mental health event with us. Um, and so I'm usually reaching out to CSR, which is Corporate Social Responsibility, ESG, which is um, uh, Environmental Social Governance um, at corporations, DEI, um, people. I, people who are looking for executive positioning, oftentimes they have separate budgets from some of the other organizations. Um, corporate government affairs cares a lot about corporate reputation um, and they're increasingly understanding getting beyond just policymakers and to civically engaged individuals. Um, corporate foundations are another place where I go. And then to some lesser extent, communications and marketing. But to be honest, marketing is really tough because we don't play the same game as a lot of news organizations. You know, a lot of other news organizations, when they think about where they want to put their dollars, marketing is thinking of consumer. So they're thinking of scale um, or customization, like big content studios. And we just simply don't and can't do that. We, we are not going to ever go after the scale game. This is about quality over quantity for us. And in terms of customization, we're just never going to invest huge amounts of money on the business side. It's going to go back to the journalism. And so sometimes when you reach out to communications and marketing for us, they just, they want, you know, big splashy campaigns to, to high volume people. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important. So I'm, I was in Beltway Media for years and most of my contacts before I joined the 19th are in corporate government affairs. Now they don't always have budgets, but what I have done is I have created advocates, right? So if I go to my contact and say, look, this is the work we're doing do you have budget? No, we don't have budget. Okay, who do I go to? Can you help guide me um, through your organization and let me know who has money? And sometimes it's it's different everywhere, right? So sometimes DEI is just internally focused. Some organizations now have you know DEI external communications people. That's increasingly um, popular, and so there's actually more budget there. Um, other times it is marketing and they do have endeavors and they understand what we're doing and who we're reaching and they, they understand the premium that we put on that. Um, and so I would really recommend, especially with any nonprofit newsroom with a very sp specific mission, reaching out to um, people who could be your advocates and having them get you through the organization. Okay, hold on one second. So I'm just going to go back here to the chat. Um, Okay. So yes. Okay. Kat, how did I determine how to charge? So I basically worked backwards to around the traffic that I thought. So for digital, um, I was looking at about a $90 CPM, anywhere from 75 to hundred. Now I worked in Beltway Media. That's what we charge for our larger scale, um, high profile campaigns. And since this is a 50% share of voice and a newsletter that has like a 42% open rate, I feel like we can justify having this chart, like basically in my mind, thinking about that framing. I worked backwards to a, like to a vague CPM. I don't tell them that, but I, I have to build in the value. So for me, usually we see around, I don't know, a hundred and 25,000 impressions across the week, um, or 130,000. The, the homepage takeover gets about five for a one day. And then the, the site advertising across a week is about 125,000. And then our newsletter gets about any, well, about 125,000 also. Um, and so it works back to about a $90 CPM. Again, I don't I don't sell anything CPM, but from a value standpoint, I can't go out and just put hundred dollar CPM and they get 5,000 impressions like that just wouldn't work. They wouldn't come back to me. So, um, so that's kind of how I worked back to, um, to the CPM. So Wendy, yes. Um, so we are top sponsorship of our big annual event. So our big annual event was, we, we launched it in August of 2020. It was huge. We had Kamala Harris and her fo first post VP nomination interview. Um, we had Megan, the Duchess of Sussex. I think we had 185,000 viewers across. It was actually over five days. 
Um, and so, and it's come down obviously from that. That was when everyone was stuck in their houses. There was nowhere to go. No one was on vacation. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty big, it has a really big impact. We have a big audience for that. Um, and so we offer, and I can actually share this out to just some of our um, events pages so that you can see the benefits. Um, we have an events deck. It's 150,000 for two founding sponsors at the highest level. And then we have a 75, and that is the 10 minute panel. And then at 75,000, we have presenting level um, sponsors and they have basically welcome remarks prior to a panel. So if there's a contextually relevant panel, then that's the, the benefit at the event itself for them. Um, we also have a reception sponsor because now we're in person for one of the days. Um, and so we do the, um, oh, I'm sorry, did it? I took it down and I can pull it back oh, up. Oh, you did, okay, perfect. Um, they, so, so, and then we have a reception sponsor, which is also 75,000. And I just call that basically another presenting level. And then 30,000 is really just logo presence. Mostly that's for foundations that want to support us. And that's kind of their option. Certainly we've had foundations do higher level, but that's, you know, that $30,000 level is a way that they can engage. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Elite. Um, asked, can you talk about your built if sold sponsorship strategy? How many events and sponsorship packages do you run exclusively? Um, do you mind just, at, can you unmute yourself and just ask me that? I'm not sure I totally. Hi. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. How are you? I'm a light. Hey, um, so I previously was in a role that I had to figure out the built if sold strategy on the news side um, and sales things. So we were very excited to launch a bunch of things, but that timeline, as you know, is like, as everyone probably knows, is very difficult to be able to execute something. So let's just take events, for instance. Mm -hmm. How many, um, what's the strategy around events are very difficult to, and expensive and like labor intensive to produce? How do you decide whether to run X number of events that are sponsored? Like, and um, what does that timeline look like that you give your teams? Mm -hmm. um, there's always that tension, I think, between revenue and news and maybe events too, depending on how it's structured. We'd so love to we have that. a completely different structure than what I'm used to. So I always yeah. ran events teams, right? Under the revenue side. Obviously, we always got, you know, we worked with the newsroom to make sure that the, the content, that the topics were, were um, in line. Um, our events are now within news within the newsroom. Um, there's nothing built of sold. So our editorial decides what events they want to do, mostly virtual. So the, the the cost is very low. I mean, that's a huge one. Um, and then they basically give us a calendar of events, which I'll show you in the deck and just, uh, I think it's in another slide. Um, uh, oh no, I just showed you. So all of the events that we have coming up and, um, and then from there, we go and get sponsors. Now, there's downside to this because um, when it's built if sold, you already have a sponsor. And so there are times where um, our, you know, it's rare, but there are times we either have to discount or we, because the timing is just so tight. Um, and I do think events have softened. The sponsorship market for events have definitely softened. And so, whereas, you know, I mean, we sold a million dollars of events in 2021. Um, last year, it was down to like, I don't know, 600,000. And this year has been hard. Um, so, but but the benefit to that is that the newsroom knows exactly what they're doing. Um, they sometimes, you know, like our January event, we ended up not getting a sponsor. We had Fawn Weaver, who's amazing. She's an entrepreneur um, from Uncle Nearest, uh, or February, excuse me. But we found out right before um, that she was going to join us. So I only had like two weeks to sell it. So so there is a downside to that. Uh, and there's also an upside to that. Um, does that make sense? Did it I miss it? Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Okay, I'm just going to keep going back here. Um, okay, what is the exact equation for CPM calculation to determine? So you can just, um, for me, it was about a $90 CPM, but you can go to the CPM cal calculator. If you just Google CPM calculator, you can literally go to, um, you know, it is a three-part calculator. It's the price, 
Um, it is uh, the CPM and it's the total um, it, number of impressions. And you just put in two inputs. So if you want to, for me, it was like, okay, where can I like around 75 to 100? And I kind of went back and forth in terms of that. And then I pressure tested it with the market. Um, would you pay this? Would you pay this? I, I started with 30,000 and it was too much. And so then I went back and did 22,000. Um, okay, so this is still the audience for the events. Um, yeah, so Teresa, I was thinking about scaling this type of sponsorship. I've never worked at a smaller news organization, and I guess I'd love to throw this out to the group. Does anyone have any thoughts on scaling down? You know, obviously 22,500 is a lot for a local business. Um, does anyone have any thoughts, wants to unmute themselves and talk about your experience and how you've kind of uh, found the sweet spot there? Yeah, you know, we have in the past had organizations sponsor events, uh, some political um, candidate forums and things like that, but it's been more along the lines of five hundred dollars um, or you know a thousand dollars at the most and it's a tough sell um, when you're working with smaller organizations and they or organizations that just don't necessarily see a community-based organization as a place where they want to put their money for that kind of thing yeah you know I do I mean I guess a question and, and this is actually something I'm it's in the deck later that I'm I mean, what we're where we are right now is that what was selling earlier is just not selling now, right? It's just a tough sponsorship market. And one of the things that um, that I'm working on now is creating new products. And um, I am starting with going out to sponsors and potential sponsors and asking them what is their greatest need. Um, what do they want to accomplish? What keeps them up at night? And and really trying to solve a need. I'm in this process. I have not successfully done this. So I can't say this as someone who has successfully gone through this and I can, you know, share that with you. But I do think that um, one of the challenges we have as newsrooms is everything is about what we want, our need, right? And we're not asking sponsors, what is your need? And how can we merge that with our mission? Um, and so it's actually, it's interesting because um, I'm doing um, this fellowship, this Salzburger fellowship and, um, and at Columbia, and I was not asking the right questions before. I mean, I've been doing this for 22 years and I, I certainly would ask people, what are your goals? What are your priorities this year? Um, but I was not necessarily going out and just asking completely open-ended questions. And it's been kind of amazing in terms of what that has done to start creatively thinking about products and thinking outside the box and prototyping those and bringing them back to sponsors and internal, right? Because that's the other thing. We have two masters here, three, if we include our audience, which we have to at some point as well. But, um, and so it's a little bit, but I think starting with that sponsor question, where, what are you investing in now? Why do you invest in that? What, what, where do you see your greatest need that, I mean, I, maybe that's simplifying it, but I do think that I've gotten more creative in terms of where people are willing to put their dollars um, based on that. And, you know, again, we're a national news organization. I know that is different than local, but I still think that um, prioritizing budget is prioritizing budget. And if you can find that sweet spot, uh, I think there's value there. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, so Deborah, are they resistant to the CPM? You know, my background is is Beltway Media and thought leadership, CSR, corporate social responsibility campaigns, and they're used to spending that. So I, now I will say when I was, um, you know, years and years ago at The Hill or years and years ago at National Journal, it it was hard. I mean, Ad agencies are tough and I try to avoid them as much as I can because they don't understand quality over quantity. They, they, they kind of do, but you got to figure out who, who 
gets you? Who is your advocate? Who understands how much value you have and how much differentiated value you have? And so for me, when I was first starting out in this business in 2001, um, you know, my boss would say, you know, sometimes you have to go to New York and see those agencies, but you cannot do that without meeting with your clients here in Washington. They understand that they want to meet, they want to reach 535 people on Capitol Hill. And all of the CPMs don't matter if you're effectively reaching those people. And I think that's the case that I have made about our audience. It's differentiated. Um, it's coming to us for something completely different than anyone else. These organizations want to be mission aligned with us. DEI showcasing their reputation is really, really important. And so in some ways, I want to be a premium. Uh, that's that's part of the, of the draw. Um, and I would say, you know, our website doesn't have programmatic. It is it is pretty elegantly designed. You know, we don't have pop-ups. We don't have, you know, it's it's a good place for people who care about their reputation. Um, and so there's a win-win there. You know, they're not just putting it out on a website that doesn't have great content. Conceptually, I'm so not a salesperson or involved in this world, really. I'm just here organizing this. But to me, at least, that resonates with local news organizations as well, that if a local business is just after scale, they can take out a Facebook or Instagram ad or a Google ad. But if if you're a local news organization really serving your community, you have a targeted audience in the community. You have that brand reputation. You're a trusted um, asset in, in that community. And that alignment um, seems like it, it would resonate locally as well. Yeah. Deborah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that answer. I mean, we've been we we've been trying to figure this out for about nine months now. Like, how are we going to position um, as a premium? And it could be that it's just religion is just hard because it's and it's journalism about religion. Yeah, that's always controversial. So that's just it's just a thing. But and it could also be that the endemic advertisers. Are, are like, you know, universities or like book publishers, things like that. They don't actually have a lot of money. I say all that, but we've also started to realize there's, there is this slice in the DEI space because um, there are a lot of corporations who are now trying to recognize religion as, you know, sort of a religious freedom DEI issue. Fascinating. And, but again, but we're still like, like, oh, it's just this like Sisyphean climb um, to get them to, there are some that are, but they get it, they've already started, but then you have to find those people and then find the budget. Um, but it, your, your audience is actually, and your, your task is actually fairly similar to ours and probably your, your audit, you know, we have a really highly educated, highly and very wealthy audience um, but I, I'm just really struggling to crack the code that you've cracked. So <laughs> props to you. <laughs> well, you know, I actually think that, um, if for, when I first started, I thought, um, oh no, I'm not, and, and I still have blind spots. Certainly. I, I, but I thought that my government affairs experience, my, my beltway experience might be a disadvantage. And then I realized that it was an advantage in some ways, just because these were people who cared about reputation management. They cared about, um, positioning. They understood brand positioning. Most marketing people don't, right? Most. And so now I will say I have some blind spots. I mean, you know, sometimes my colleagues will say, you know, have you reached out to Athleta? And I'm like, oh no, I didn't even think about them. So the, I have my own blind spots, you know, especially at these big corporations where I don't, you know, they don't have government affairs offices or they don't. And so what's my way in? So I struggle with that too, um, in some cases as well, honestly, I could do better at that. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe uh, if, if you don't mind, I may just ask to if my the uh, consultant can just connect with you. Yes, I'm like, happy to connect with anyone. Yes, in 15 minutes, just like, yes, I'm so, happy to. You. Yeah, that's for anyone, really. I'm happy to to help. I I really. Um, and I'm sure you all have expertise as well that, you know, that I could really benefit from. So I'm really open to that. Um, okay. So we have Ashley. Oh, Ashley shared a little bit in the um, chat here about 
um, packaging. So I will let you um, see that in the chat. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Corey asked about um, really more tactical uh, question about outreach. And that is, um, you know, including the seller alignment in the, in the ask. Um, it kind of depends for me. I'm a little bit of a gut instinct person. But one of the things that I have learned is I have a really quick um, email that um, just introduces myself. I'm Johanna Derlega. I'm the CS, you know, CRO of the 19th. Um, this is what we cover. Um, I would love to just do an introductory call to understand um, your, your goals and your priorities and to share more about the 19th. Here's the Cliffs note, notes on us and how we're different. And I literally have like four bullets um, and, and that works. I mean, sometimes it works better than others, but I do think that trying to sell, I certainly have sent the email about a specific event. If it's really aligned, you know, if, um, if we're doing something on, um, I don't know, economic empowerment, and I haven't connected to the right person at bank of America, I've gone to like a million people there and it's like, everything's a dead end. I may just send it out. Like, here's who we have. This is, or actually we've got an event coming up on mental health and we have an NBA star. So what I did was um, I went to, or WNBA. So I went to the WNBA, who are those sponsors? Um, and then, and who cares about mental health? And I did, I put all of that there. And and actually I got a couple of people who responded to me. Um, and so it just depends on if it's a super perfect fit or not. Um, if it's not, then I just keep it really vague and just introduction. Like for me, and this is what I always say to people, um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, I want to develop a relationship. I want to understand what you want to accomplish in this space. Um, I want to share information about myself. And I, it's not always the right time in terms of these budgets. And so I just want to be top of mind. And so in, in, in fact, someone emailed me. I was trying to get an intro. Um, it was like a friend of a friend and she wrote back and said, we don't have any money for, for sponsorships. And I said, I totally understand. And if now is not a good time, I get that. I just want to make clear that all I'm looking to do is, is develop a relationship, understand what your needs are, share some information about us so that down the line, if there's an alignment, if there's a fit that we can reach out to each other. Um, and she actually responded and we're doing the meeting. So, you know, sometimes it's like, how do you create the relationship? Because the other thing is that if you want to, and we have to constantly update products, who are the people that you can reach out to and say, what do you think about this product? Um, what keeps you up at night, right? Like that is really important. And so it's not a transact. It's to me, I know that there's always like the next thing we have to sell, right? Like we want to, we want financial sustainability, but you also want those relationships where you can be refining and creating products and understanding their needs um, and asking their advice uh, seeing if they would connect you with people. And the only way you can do that is if you are, you see that relationship as a marathon, not a sprint. All right. Um, oh yeah. Events are tougher for a smaller organization. I still think though, I think having some like really open-ended conversations with your sponsors about what would be, what would they be willing to invest in? It might not, but I do think, you know, when I was at National Journal, we launched a regional event. Now we were politics and policy. So, but we launched a regional event, um, like a, a whole program. And it was so amazing to get out of Washington. Washington, jaded, so many events to attend. I'm just going to say yes. I'm just not going to show up. We did it. I remember Des Moines specifically. We had a room for like 150 people. We had like, we always looked for a 50% attrition rate. So we wanted 300 if we had 150 slots. Well, we had 300 and they all showed up. <laughs> this is an overflow, overflow room. So I do think that sometimes in like regional areas, again, it depends on how big they are, but like, and I, COVID is tough too, but I do think people want to get together again. 
So, um, so anyway, I encourage you to continue and maybe you've already done this, had, have the conversations about like, what would you invest in? Um, okay. So Kat has- Can I share a favorite, uh, an example of this also that's not events? Yeah. And this is like dec a decade ago, probably, but Richland Source, which is a small digital startup in Ohio, they're amazing. Encourage you to check them out. Right when they were getting started, they realized in, in their community that high school sports were a big deal. So they were able to got like popcorn bags printed up with their logo on it. And I believe sold some sponsorships on the popcorn bags and then just gave them for free to the um people selling it at the stadiums. And so it was an opportunity to recognize that audience need um, in a sense also. So I think it's really about more broadly than popcorn bags, but also just knowing your community and knowing what is of service to, to the community in a sense. That's great. Um, should I, maybe, do you wanna get the deck back up? I, let me just finish up the deck. Keep, does, is this working for you just to answer questions as we go along? <laughs> I hope this is okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. So potential buyers, you know, again, who is your advocate? Who can, who can guide you through um, and give you really honest feedback in Intel about what they're willing to um, invest in? Okay. So this is what I was talking about in terms of us. Like we are now in the process because our, you know, products in, in this environment is tough. We are really struggling this year to sell through. Um, and, and, you know, again, we're diversified nonprofit model. So we're in good shape in terms of major donors, foundation support, but we want earned, right? We want people to want to pay for what we have to offer. Um, there's value there. So, um, for me, when I started thinking about what products, it's really about, you know, audience needs, although that is, we do have an audience director. So I didn't start there. What I started with actually is, um, is our sponsor needs. Um, and I, uh, I have done now 18 interviews. This is internal and extra also experts. I reached out to experts. Um, I reached out to an expert that's on like the today show. And I went through their website and I, um, I did a auto, you know, like one of those, you know, it, if you'd like to reach Lily uh, email here. And I didn't think anyone would ever get back to me. And they gave me 30 minutes of their time to talk about CSR at corporations. And, um, and I was able to talk about some of the products that I was thinking about and they gave me feedback. So um, expert information, you know, talking to different people at different organizations um, is, is I think, really important. I talk to sponsors and potential sponsors to, again, with broader questions about where they would invest, where they're investing now, what is most important, what keeps you up, um, what are your biggest needs, what are your biggest challenges, um, and that was really helpful. And then, obviously, internally, there are guardrails here. There are editorial um, integrity guardrails. There are are pricing and, you know, in terms of, you know, what can we invest here? Um, what corporations are we comfortable uh, working with? Are we comfortable or are we not, right? So there are a lot of guardrails. And so being able to get the, that information. So basically, this is my, sh like, steps that I'm taking right now to try to figure out um, this. And so I've done my research, I actually just had one more conversation today, my initial research. And I now have prototypes and I'm bringing those prototypes. They're like one page using my, as much of my artistic la you know, very little artistic abilities to create some prototypes, one page prototypes of like a web page or landing page or something else that showcases the product. And now I'm bringing that back and bringing it to sponsors that I've already spoken to, um, to get their feedback to rate what of these benefits would be most interesting to you. I'm going back to internally asking my co-founders what, um, what gives you a heart attack or what feels easy or what are you willing to invest in? And then once I do that, have kind of start refining the prototype into a product 
understanding the staffing needs. That's really, um, you know, obviously working with audience here is really important as well. Um, and then understanding the investments. Are we willing to make these investments? If, we, if I've already had conversations with potential sponsors, they've had a seat at the table. So going back to them and saying, would you, are you going to buy this? Um, is almost a shortcut to, to bringing in some business um, and then finalizing the prototype into a product and selling it. So that's kind of where I am right now. Um, you know, that's just to say that, uh, you know, keep adapting products, um, obviously creating things that align with mission and coverage, stay close to your clients and get their feedback um, and finding advocates within the organization. So that's, that's my deck. Let me see if there are any other questions. Okay, no more questions. Does anyone want to raise their hand with any other questions? I have questions if no one else does, but Great. want to. I loved hearing about that research and iteration process. And it it sounds like, I mean, it's time to do the interviews, but it sounds like it's a pretty simple, straightforward, not a huge amount of investment that the point is it for it to be sort of quick and dirty and, mm -hmm. and you can learn as you go and, and iterate pretty quickly, it sounds like. Yeah, I... I tried to, I didn't do this as well externally. Internally, I had the same set of questions. Um, and um, so I, but externally, I tried to start just really big. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me, and I don't think I would have made the time if it weren't being part of a, a program that keeps me accountable, is the day-to-day -day is always overriding the long-term. And, you know, that like looking at my feed versus the horizon. And I realized through this process that this is perspective. You know, I mean, sometimes it's like, you know, I, I mentioned that our events are not built of sold. So there's another event every month. And I'm just constantly like, oh my God, what's the next event? I got to sell this next event. And I'm the only one who now our foundation person has really been wonderful. And we're seeing more foundations doing these sponsorships, but you know, it, I just feel like I'm constantly looking at my feet and to create this space for myself um, and to be creative, to practice that instead of just the day to day constantly selling um, has been also really invigorating. Um, and again, I know sometimes we don't want to prioritize the outreach um, in, in this in this larger scale way, but ultimately these are potential sponsors. These are potential clients. And so in some ways, asking them to have a seat at the table of, of product creation is a real opportunity for them to form something that they want to buy. And, um, and so I actually think that even though it feels time consuming in a way from your day-to-day -day selling, it's actually longer term, really valuable um, for the bottom line. We have a couple more questions. Okay. Emails. <laughs> this is a tough one. So I, um, and this is, you know, uh, it's expensive. So um, I have used my entire career, something called leadership directories. And that is basically government affairs. It, it's also like CEOs and COOs and increasingly they'll, they'll include like DEI people and um, DEI external communications, like they're really getting pretty um, savvy in terms of adding that. Um, it was about $5,000 a year, but in terms of costs, like time savings, I was like, I, I can't, going to LinkedIn and trying to find someone and then trying to figure out their email was just, it was, it was not, I mean, the $5,000 was very expensive, but to me it was worth it. But they just came back and said, we're changing our model and it's no longer a seat model, it's a corporate model and it's gonna be $15,000. So I'm back at square one. <laughs> um, but what we've done is we've now gotten Rocket Reach. Now Rocket Reach is a little bit better for my major donor people because it's a lot of personal emails, but um, they're, there are some corporate emails and I'm just trying to work around. So I usually now go to LinkedIn. I look up first who's connected with me, like at a company. So I'll go to IBM. I just went to IBM and I 
I've never really made a lot of progress at I IBM, even when I was at National Journal and, and The Hill. Um, and I'd reached out to a few people through leadership. No one ever got back to me. So I um, went to LinkedIn. I found someone who was connected with that someone. And then I went to Rocket Reach and I found their email address and they got right back to me. <laughs> so um, I do think that's good. I think I actually do subscribe to the LinkedIn sales version no one has ever responded to me when I use that platform to try to get someone to respond to me. I think that like emailing someone directly is, is much, much better. If you can get an intro even better. And so it takes longer, but if you have anyone connected to you via LinkedIn and you can ask for an intro or you can say, Hey, I see we have this person in common. If you can get their email address. So right now we're using rocket reach. I do kind of miss leadership, but it's too expensive. Um, Okay, my timeline for getting through the steps. Well, um, Linda, it is the Sulzberger program is five months. So that, that's my timeline. <laughs> I think if I were doing this on my own, I would probably, um, it would take me forever because it would be hard to prioritize. So I almost think if I weren't doing this, if someone were to tell me, I think I'd have to put, you know what I would do? Actually, if I didn't have this program and I knew this existed and I, I'm also happy to, um, you know, talk through this more offline, I would try to find other people who need to do this work also, maybe through this network and, and create some internal deadlines for yourselves and hold each other accountable, even if it's just one other person and come bring your, what you're hearing, what you're learning, um, how you, you know, for, for us in this program, we, we create a deck. Um, and, um, and so that is something that we just share the deck and then we get feedback um, or we share the prototypes, those quick one page, you know, illustrations to showcase a product and we get feedback because they're doing this also. And so um, I think that that's what I would do if I wasn't in this, because that to me, the value is in this network, this, these amazing people who have so much to share, um, and they keep you accountable. So that's what I would recommend. Um, we're totally happy to set something like that up. I'll send an email out with the recording and, and the slides, and we can have a quick sign up and, um, share that with everyone who's interested. So thank you for that terrific idea. So, yeah, I think, um, a recent example. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm working on this now. Um, it, it's, it's open-ended, right. Is, is my, the product, I don't know what the product is going to be yet. Cause I'm in the prototyping phase, but I started with, um, I basically took almost a month and did, um, all of these interviews, 18 interviews. Um, and then I created a deck um, and, uh, with findings, um, I gathered the information, um, so that I could kind of pull it and, and check it out. And then, um, and then I started doing the prototyping basically, um, you know, based on that, I almost needed marination time, uh, to really see what I was, you know, what I was gathering. Cause sometimes it's so much information. And then, I created some quick prototypes and the quick prototypes were literally these one pagers. I took pictures of them and put them in a deck and I um, shared them with um, our co-founder. I'm sharing them with um, basically the person, the main person that I feel like um, she was as the op most open with me. I'm sharing that with her on Monday to get her feedback. And then from there, I'm going to refine it and then continue to take it out to, to those people. That probably takes another month. Um, and then I'll probably spend the next month getting feedback from everyone, right? Like once I kind of refine this prototype with a couple people, then I'm going to take it out or probably be another month. And then I need to take it in. And if there's anything based on audience, then I basically have already, I just talked to my audience director. Um, she's aware of this project and I'm basically, she's going to start having conversations with our audience to see, would they want to engage in companies in this way or that way? So, so there's, it's just like a lot of, um, it's like hurting cats, I guess, a little bit. Um, but maybe give yourself a month for each phase. <laughs> I'm no expert yet. <laughs> um, okay. 
Let's just see. Oh, this is great. People are connecting. Time, re okay, you were asking about time ratio. I think um, the time of research and prep, if you're doing it with your sponsors, is basically selling. As I mean, I think it's pre-selling. So I I would almost not set a ratio in some ways of research and prep versus direct outreach. Um, but I almost think that like once once I have a product, I think I'm going to take it to I'm going to give myself. Um, I'm going to take it to 25 people. That's what I've already decided. Once I have that, you know, and again, I'm going to have all the research, the prep, I'm going to hear what, what benefits are the priorities. I'm going to, you know, figure out this product and then I'm going to take it to 25 people. And if it doesn't sell, if I don't sell it to three people, then I probably will scrap it and I will go back and try to create another product because Oh, especially if I need to make any internal investment, um, you know, and some of the things we're thinking about are like a membership, um, where do we need like a membership, per like a corporate membership? Do we need a corporate membership person? Right. Or do we need, um, like, what do we need for that? And of course that's going to be more research. Um, or if we do want to create some sort of custom content hub, that means we probably need like a custom content editor. I don't want to make any investments until I really feel strongly that this is going to sell. And I, so I think I'm going to give myself 25 people that I'm going to reach out to, and that's going to be the selling. So probably more people than I did research in. Well, amazing. Joanna, thank you so much. This was phenomenal, a really great conversation. Um, sure, we could have continued for another hour or two, but this was really, really terrific. Thank you for your transparency and such insight into your work at the 19th. I know I learned a lot. Um, so we'll be sure to share the recording, share the slides, um, and uh, any additional resources as well. And we hope you'll join us next Thursday um, at 2 p.m. Eastern for our third and final corporate workshop with Brian Flath, who's at WSIU in Illinois and here with us today, and also Libby Spareto um, at VT Digger, who will be sharing examples of really case studies of how they're working with businesses and corporations in their communities. Um, Emily Dressler, also from RevLab, I think is here, and she and I have been talking about scheduling an AMA really exclusively focused on hyper-local and local news. And so we're hopefully going to schedule that for later this spring, and we'll let you know as soon as that's um, on the calendar. Um, so yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. And um, we uh, look forward to seeing you next week, hopefully. Thanks so much. Email me. Thank you so much. Bye.